As we ended the first part of our lecture, we were finishing up our discussions of these cerebral hemispheres. Just to recap, as we look at our entire brain, the outer parts here, this is our cerebrum. Now in the second part of the lecture, we're going to move a little deeper into the brain, and we're going to go over the different parts of the diencephalon, and then the different parts of the brain stem, and we'll finish this part of our discussion with the cerebellum. This now is a mid-sagittal cut of the human brain, and it allows us to better see the different parts of our first area we're going to discuss, the diencephalon. The diencephalon is separated into the thalamus, shown here. To give you a little more orientation, this is the corpus callosum, one of the areas where we have the commissural tracts connecting the two different sides, different hemispheres of the cerebrum. Underneath the corpus callosum, this open area here is the location of cerebral spinal fluid. This is where we would have portions of our lateral ventricles. Now down here underneath, the area represented by this purple circle, this is the thalamus. The darker purple underneath the thalamus here, this is the hypothalamus. And attached to the hypothalamus are a few other important structures we'll discuss the beginning portions of the optic nerve, and then the pituitary gland hanging here from the infundibulum attaches to the hypothalamus. The third part of the diencephalon is in the more posterior portion of the diencephalon. It is called the pineal gland, also, mainly, also sometimes called the epithalamus. The pineal gland just is the majority of the epithalamus, so we typically just call it the pineal gland. The thalamus makes up the major portions of the diencephalon. Within the thalamus, we are going to have many different nuclei. Remember that in the central nervous system, nuclei is the term we use for a collection of cell bodies that are functioning in a similar manner. The thalamus is what we call the gateway to the cerebrum. Any information that comes from the outside of the brain must travel through the thalamus before it can reach the cerebrum to be analyzed. Therefore, if you think about it, all the different information is coming through this area. So what the thalamus is responsible for is sorting and editing all of that information. As we are just sitting here, obviously you're listening to me talk, you are hearing my voice, but you're also hearing many other noises around you. All of that sensory information is coming to your brain at the same time. As it moves through the thalamus, the thalamus, the thalamus determines which portions of that information need to go to the different areas of the brain. Things you are hearing need to go into the temporal lobe. Things you are seeing right now need to go to the occipital lobe. Think, if you're sitting down, you have some somatosensory um, receptors that are being activated, you're touching something. That information the thalamus must send to the different portions of your somatosensory cortex. The thalamus is the one that decides where everything goes in both directions. The thalamus also decides what information from the hypothalamus in, in regards to emotion and certain portions of our visceral functions such as the need to urinate, hunger, things like that, they're going to come from the hypothalamus to the thalamus and then move on to the cerebrum to the correct area. If we take a picture of, if we take this picture of the thalamus here, what kind of looks like jelly beans in different colors, each one of these represents a different nuclei. And each nucleus is going to be responsible for a slightly different portion of the information so that it can send it to the appropriate part of the cerebrum. Just for future reference, probably the most commonly discussed nuclei within the thalamus are called the geniculate bodies, which are found more on the posterior side of your thalamus. Going down a little further, the hypothalamus is much smaller than the thalamus, hypo insinuating it is underneath. The hypothalamus 
is not really a gateway. It is not the place where all information goes to the cerebrum. It functions as an area of overall control of how we feel and a few other things. The hypothalamus, similar to the thalamus, is composed of many different nuclei. The major nuclei that you can view from the outside of the body are called the mammillary bodies. And we'll sh I'll show you those in just a second on a picture. This slide right here lists six of the most common functions of the hypothalamus, but this is by far not all of them. Your hypothalamus controls, is the autonomic control center for your blood pressure, your heart rate, your force of your heartbeat, the motility of your digestive tract. This is the area where you can perceive a lot of things that you then turn into emotions, such as pleasure, fear, rage. Your hypothalamus helps you to regulate things by monitoring different levels of chemicals in your blood. Your body temperature is regulated this way, whether you're hungry or not, whether you are thirsty, whether you don't need to drink anything and you need to urinate, all of these things, these feelings, you could say, must m migrate through the hypothalamus. The major thing that most people link to the hypothalamus is the fact that attached to the hypothalamus through the infundibulum, we have the pituitary gland. The pituitary gland produces many different hormones, but the hypothalamus also produces some hormones that are just stored in the pituitary until it is time to release them. This picture here, again, kind of looks like pieces of jelly beans or candy. Each one of these represents the location of a nucleus within the hypothalamus. As you can see, this one I was describing earlier, the mammillary bodies, those protrude out of the bottom of the hypothalamus slightly so that we can see those when we're outside of the brain. When you do your brain dissections in lab, you will be asked to look for these mammillary bodies. The last part of the hypothalamus, the epithalamus, is mainly composed of the pineal gland. The pineal gland is responsible for one thing, and that is secreting melatonin. Melatonin is very different from melanin. Melanin was the pigment that is found in our skin. Melatonin is a chemical that is released to help regulate whether you are sleepy or not. The more melatonin you release, the sleepier you are going to be. This can be observed as we think about there have been times when even if we say we slept really late and we had gotten a lot of sleep that day, we really shouldn't be tired. But as it starts to get dark outside, most of the time we get sleepy, whether we've had enough sleep or not. And that is because as it gets dark outside, our epithalamus begins to produce melatonin because that's the natural time when we should be asleep. You can even buy melatonin as a way to help you fall asleep and it's supposedly non-habit forming and all of those things we see with prescription sleep aids. I'm going to continue this audio and go down to the next part of the brain, the brain stem. The brain stem is composed of three regions. Here, the midbrain. The front of the midbrain is typically um, called the peduncles, which look like little columns holding up the thalamus. The back of the midbrain here is called the corpora quadrigemina. The corpora quadrigemina is broken down into two different pieces, look like two little bumps on the back. This is the inferior colliculus, and this is the superior colliculus. Below, within the midbrain, we have ventricle, cerebrospinal fluid. This is the cerebral aqueduct connecting the area up here with the third ventricle down to the fourth ventricle. The large bump here on the front of the brain stem underneath the midbrain is called the pons. And then below the pons, we have a smaller bump. This is the medulla oblongata. The fourth ventricle containing cerebral spinal fluid, as well as a very important choroid plexus, is found here between the pons and the medulla and the cerebellum. Moving now to look at what the function of the brain stem is, we're going to have to consider the fact that there are a lot of things that 
connect into the brainstem and use the brainstem as a way to move into the other parts of the brain and eventually through the thalamus into the cerebrum. We will learn in chapter 13 that there are 12 pairs of cranial nerves. 10 of the 12 pairs of cranial nerves are all associated with this brainstem. The brainstem overall through these 10 cranial nerves helps us to control all of our functions that are necessary for survival. And that's pretty much the key word you need to think about when you think of any portion of the brain stem. This is what the brain stem looks like when it is completely removed and the cerebrum is taken off of the top. Now here in purple, this is each one of your paired thalamus and then the hypothalamus underneath. You can tell this is the hypothalamus because we can see the mammillary bodies and the optic nerves coming out here. The green represents the brain stem. The two front areas here, these are parts of your midbrain. You can see all of the cranial nerves connecting in. If we look up here on the side, can you see why these are your portions of your midbrain called the peduncles because they look like they are the columns that the thalamus is sitting on. In the back here we can see the bumps. That's the corpora quadrigemina of the midbrain. Moving down, now this is the pons. Again, lots of cranial nerves attached to the pons. And then the medulla, more cranial nerves attached here. The midbrain itself is responsible for relaying the information from our visual and auditory reflexes. This is why we have two different regions of the corpora quadrigemina. The superior curricula of the corpora quadrigemina is the area for your visual reflexes. If you think about what your visual reflexes would be, if someone is throwing something at your head, then the reflex you would have in response to that the thing you can see coming out your head is to move out of the way. Those sorts of things are relayed through the superior area. Your inferior area contains the reflex centers for your auditory control, things you can hear that warn you that something is happening. Other than the nuclei located within the corpora quadrigemina, there's two other areas that are important. The substantia nigra is a very dark area, hence its name. This is an area of the midbrain that is functional and linked to the basal nuclei. If you recall, the basal nuclei were the nuclei within the white matter of the cerebrum. The red nucleus is a relay nuclei area located within the midbrain. This is going to be an area where we have some of our reticular formation as well as motor pathways. We'll discuss reticular formation a little later. The pons is an area, again, slightly lower below the midbrain. The pons is responsible for helping us to maintain the normal rhythm of our breathing. It is not the area where we initiate the need to breathe. It is just the area that keeps our breathing at a normal rate. Since we all probably realize that the rate of our breathing is controlled by the rate that our intercoastal muscles, the muscles within our ribcage and our diaphragm contract, we can understand that within the pons you're going to have mainly motor fibers running. The medulla oblongata below the pons is the area that controls all of your life functions. This is the cardiovascular center of your brain. Your heart is center, your heart is told to initiate contraction by fibers running from your medulla oblongata. Your respiratory centers are initiated here within the medulla. If something happens to your medulla, this would be considered something that you could not recuperate from. You wouldn't just have slight damage. It wouldn't change you. You would not be able to survive if you did not have your medulla to tell your heart and your lungs what to do. There are a few other minor things that are monitored by your medulla and your medulla 
initiates your need to think, do things like vomit, hiccup, swallow, cough, sneeze, those sorts of things. But those are not the life functions. The life functions of the medulla are the most important. The final portion of the brain that I'd like to discuss in this lecture is the cerebellum. Your cerebellum is responsible for your coordination. It provides the proper timing for your muscle contractions. Remember that your premotor area and your primary motor area are the areas of your cerebrum that tell your muscles to move. That information has to be combined with information from your cerebellum to help you determine the best way for you to move in order to keep your balance and move in the most efficient manner. As we look at the anatomy of our cerebellum, you notice it looks a lot more wrinkly than the cerebrum did. Since this is so much more wrinkly, we don't call these gyri, we call these folia. If we cut open the cerebellum with a mid-sagittal cut, we can see that within the cerebellum we have a center area of white matter that's called the arbor vitae. It has this name because it sort of looks like a tree with branches. If we, as we look at the functions of the cerebellum, we kind of separate it into two different parts. We have the motor processing. The way this works, your cerebellum receives the impulse from the premotor and the primary motor area of your cerebrum saying, we're going to make something move. We're going to make your leg move. It takes that information, the cerebellum takes that information and combines it with information that it gets from the sensory areas of your body telling you where your body is at that moment. Your cerebellum puts all that information together and then sends a specific blueprint or pattern to your muscles so that your muscles can move correctly. It is possible to train your cerebellum to obtain better coordination, better balance, and, more, and better abilities to do certain movements. Some people that have trained their cerebellum to do things like this would be um, ballet dancers, um, figure skaters, people that can spin and spin and spin and never fall over, being dizzy. They have obviously been working on their cerebellum. Um, people that fly fighter jets and things like that, they have to go through a lot of training to train their cerebellum to be able to calculate their body movements even though they are doing those strange things with their normal body orientation. The cognitive function of your cerebellum is a little harder to explain, but what it helps you do is it helps you combine memories you have of patterns and things like that so that you can put those together to help you predict how to best handle a new situation. So if you have, say if you're somebody that's good at putting puzzles together very fast, then you are someone that has trained your cerebellum to do that. The reason you're able to get faster at that is because your cerebellum has memories of doing it over and over again. Just to end this part of the lecture, let's talk a little bit about some of our functional brain systems. There's two important functional brain systems. We have the limbic system and the reticular formation. Your limbic system and reticular formation cannot be found in just one area of your brain. This is going to be something that your brain can functionally do by combining a lot of different areas together. Your limbic system is your emotional brain. This is the part of your brain that attaches emotion to some sort of memory. One particular area of importance to mention is the amygdala. Your amygdala is the part of your brain that responds when you combine the fact that someone has a mean look on their face. That must mean they're mad. And I can promise you that that's not something you are born with the ability to do. You must form a memory to put the emotion together with the response, the, the expression on someone's face. If you show a one-year-old or a two-year-old even pictures of someone with a mad face and a happy face, they may not be able to tell you what those faces mean. 
But if you show an unhappy person to an adult, they can immediately tell you how that person was feeling. Um, sca being scared, same sort of thing. You can do that. That is all processed by the amygdala. Your limbic system also puts emotional responses to odors. I always use the example in my classes. If I ask you, does a skunk smell bad, everyone would tell me yes. It actually turns out that there really is no such thing as a bad smell. There are some chemicals that elicit a taste response. You can smell it so bad. It smells so bad that you can taste it. The taste does come from our evolution to be able to avoid chemicals that ingesting chemicals that may be bad for us or smelling chemicals that may be bad for us. But there's nothing about the smell of a skunk that's going to hurt you. The reason you think a skunk smells bad is because at some point in your life, probably when you were a young child, you smelled a skunk and someone around you said, gosh, that stinks. So you immediately associate that smell means that that smells bad or garbage stinks. The only reason it stinks is because your brain has been taught that that's a bad smell. Um, moving to the reticular formation just a little bit. Your reticular formation has one really neat area called the reticular activating system. This is the part of your brain that filters out repetitive stimuli or very weak stimuli. This is what allows you to remain focused on something and ignore anything that's happening around you. If you're one of those people that can sit in a noisy room maybe with the TV going and still study, and never really pay attention to what's going on around you, then your reticular activating system is really working. There are some people that, and there's even disorders for some people, that no matter how hard they try, they cannot focus on one task. Any little stimulus that comes in from the side, their mind will then switch and focus to that. And that signifies an, a problem in their reticular activating system. I'm going to end here with part two. Then I'll pick back up with part three where we'll go over the meninges and the spinal cord.